Welcome to Wycliffe Mound State Historic Site and to everyone that's uh, that's on the Zoom call. Thank you for for logging in. Um, it, my name is Carla Hildebrand and I am the park manager here and I've been here about 23 years plus some summers as an intern. Um, my educational background is in archaeology. Um, I have a master's in, um, in archaeology and I started working here in the beginning as the assistant director to Dr. Kit Wessler, who was a professor of archeology span at Murray State University and director of this site, the Wycliffe Mounds Research Center. And after a time, uh, the site here was uh, turned over, transferred to the Commonwealth of Kentucky and uh, became a state historic site with Kentucky State Parks. And I was appointed as park manager. And so I've been here since telling the story of this site and trying to preserve it the best that we can. And so I thank you all for coming. Um, I think maybe a good place to start is at the beginning. And the beginning of this site seems to be the Native American experience here. Sometime in the early 1100s, Native people of the Mississippian culture moved up to this bluff. This bluff overlooks the Mississippi River. It's across the street there behind the trees. It's the first high ground south, or south of the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, which meets four miles up here at Cairo, Illinois. And so these native people built a village with mounds, a central plaza, houses, farm fields of corn and squash and other crops. And they lived up here for several hundred years maintaining these earthen mounds, continuing with their farming and building their houses, compacted here on this bluff, about six acres surrounding where we're standing now. Um, in the mid 1300s, for reasons that we still look at as researchers, they abandoned this village and moved out of the area. And so back to the time that this site was occupied, the site began with building the first mound here that was dedicated to the chief's family, the person that was in charge of the village. And that's this mound that we have here to our left. It's a platform style mound, flat top, four sides, and that was the residence of someone very important who lived here. Um, this, that was the first mound that these Native people built, followed very closely by the largest mound on the site, which is here to our right. We call it a ceremonial mound, but other names for it have been temple mound because it is for religious activities. It is the the, the Mississippian style of flat top, four sides, built in stages by the basket load of dirt. These are things that we can tell by our archaeological studies uh, through excavations. We're studying the stratigraphy, the layers of soil that these mounds have been built up. And you can see the basket loading of uh, dirt that helped produce these mounds to the size that you see them today. They weren't built overnight. It took several hundred years to get them the size that you see them today. What these native people did of the Mississippian culture is they built a little platform and put whatever building they needed on it. For this would have been a resident. For that, it would have been a public building for religious activities. And then once they were finished with that, they, these buildings seem to be burned down 
and more dirt would be brought back uh, to pack in and build it up a little higher. Maybe a new chief has uh, seceded. Uh, there are reasons for uh, ritually for build uh, for building up new dirt to re for renewal. So that's why we see the mounds that we see them today. But they were not built overnight, so it took some time, and it took labor. That took people, people of the village, to help build and maintain these mounds. They were so important to them. These mound sites are every five to 10 miles up and down the Mississippi River Valley here. And um, they have cultural characteristics in common, which makes it this vast Mississippian culture that we see. Cahokia Mounds is the most well-known and largest Mississippian site. It's, it's on the Illinois side of the St. Louis metropolitan area, the Cahokia Mound site. It was where Mississippian culture began sometime in the 800s, and it's where Mississippian culture began its decline sometime in the mid 1200s. And that societal decline had a ripple effect on all these Mississippian villages up and down the rivers here to where by A.D. 1400, we don't see any of these villages occupied by Native people in this area that we call the central Mississippi River Valley. And that's another thing that re researchers are still working on. Wh why did they abandon the villages? Where did they go? What, what happened in Mississippian society caused this collapse? Um, so back to the village here, <laughs> um, they, again, they were farmers and their main, their, their main um, activity was their, 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 their corn crops, but they also made pottery. There's a certain pottery style. They made stone tools, other bone and shell implements. They also buried their dead here. And we do have a burial mound, and that is the mound that's located behind this one up to the north end of the site here. Um, each one of the mounds here does have a, a signage that helps explain what that mound is. But the burial mound here dates to the 1200s. There were probably about 800 people buried in and around that mound. Um, one of the things that we've studied extensively is that burial mound because as we talk about the history of this site that was one of the main attractions for many decades was the burial mound and so these native people they they had a mound of dirt they dug into it they placed a burial and they would bury them back and the next person that needed burial, they would do the same thing. So what you're seeing are, instead of cemeteries like we see them today, where everybody's in neat little rows, what we're seeing in Mississippian burial mounds, it's just a little mound of dirt, right? Where they, people are laid out one next to the other in a communal mound together. And they were a uh, majority of the burials here were what we call extended, which would be laid out straight. But we do have a few cases of uh, what is called bundle burials. Bundle burials are situations where human remains are allowed to deflesh, decompose somewhere. And the bones are then bundled together and buried back in the main community mound. A lot of reasons for, for that, but we do have a few examples of bundle burials as well. So it's, um, lear we learned so much information about burials like gender, there were more females buried in the burial mound than males for some reason, just a few. The average age of death was about 35. Sometimes people would live to their early 40s. Um, many of us would be ancient elders to their culture, including myself. 
Um, <laughs> they had, you know, we could see some types of uh, health and diseases, such as the people that lived here in this village and were buried here seemed to suffer a lot from arthritis. We could see that in their bones and their joints. And some people did have some periods of uh, malnutrition, and we can see that affects on your on your on your bones and skull. Um, so maybe there were some harsh times with their corn crops or their hunting. So we see these things in the burials, and in their their they provide good information about the people that lived here. But we also want to be very respectful because these are not our burials that we're studying. These are Native American ancestors. And so we have worked very closely and carefully through the years since Murray State University took over the site, which I'll talk about in a moment, to reach out to Native American communities for consultations and discussions about what the proper thing to do with these burials and talking about them and studying them. Today, our policy is that we do research as ongoing. It's just that the research is non-invasive, if at all possible. And so there's so many wonderful technological advances to do things like ground penetrating radar and remote sensing and other techniques that will help us learn what's under the ground, what's, what's under our feet here, <laughs> and being able to interpret and understand the, the, the archaeological deposits here without being destructive. Archaeology is one of these destructive sciences. Once you dig in the ground, you, the, that's destroyed. That's why archaeologists are very nitpicky about documentation and photography and writing down everything. What color is the soil? What texture is the soil? What level are we at? Where are we at on a map grid? Um, you know, what artifacts are found in context with other artifacts? And we record and document all this information because then when we're done with the excavation unit, standard practice is to just backfill it. So you can't go back and learn what that was about because you've destroyed it. So hopefully we we're, can we're, go back to records and, and study those. So there's a lot of that here too. We have so many years of research that could be, could be studied and analyzed through that method too. So after the Mississippian people abandoned the village, this, 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 this site really didn't have much activity after. Till we get into the 1600s, we have the French river explorers coming through. And there's, you know, like, this, the, uh, like La Salle and Marquette and Joliet. Um, I'm, I'm an archeologist. My references are, what we call prehistoric. So some of you may be able to correct this, but it's either LaSalle or Marquette and Joliet noted in their journals of being feasted by native people when they came to this bank here in Wycliffe. So some native people must have been living in this area that they encountered those river explorers in the 1600s. Later, we get some uh, activity here in Wycliffe um, from the 1700s, around the time of the Revolutionary War. Um, we have a fort here in Wycliffe, Fort Jefferson, 1780 to 81. And that was George Rogers Clark. And he built a fort here, naming it after the president, Fort Jefferson, or after Jefferson. And it was occupied a, a little while as a fort here in Wycliffe, and um, it was important strategically because if you think about times of war in those days, 
whoever could control major river areas like a confluence of a, two major rivers like the Ohio and Mississippi River could have an upper hand, right? So to keep British forces out, Americans built a fort here. And um, the thing about that fort is I tell, as opposed to an American revolutionary Amer war details, I'm interested in the Chickasaw perspective. This whole area is the Jackson Purchase, right? Who did we purchase it from? The Chickasaws. <laughs> and so the Chickasaws claimed this as homeland by a treaty, uh, a previous treaty, and they sided with the British during the American Revolution. And so British forces uh, sort of worked with Chickasaws from further south, like in North Mississippi, to come up and, and raid the fort. And so in 1781, the Chickasaws raided the fort. It, it, it created the collapse of the fort. The town that the fort built uh, as a... As a, as a in tandem with the fort, there was a town and it was called uh, Clarksville, I believe. And, um, and so that Clarksville town, there were still settlers that still lived there for a few years uh, here in Wycliffe, uh, but eventually that, that town was abandoned as well. So then we're getting into the 1800s. Hello, we got some more folks coming in. Um, Lewis and Clark on their famous expedition <laughs> in 1803, they were coming down the Ohio River and they camped at Cairo, Illinois. Well, uh, Clark wanted, William Clark, he wanted to see the remains of Old Fort Jefferson of his older brother, George Rogers Clark. So they made a little uh, side trip down to uh, the remains of Old Fort Jefferson while they were camped for about a couple of weeks in Cairo, Illinois. And they were also taking astronomical measurements because um, they had received some new equipment uh, that they were trying, I think it's called a sextant to help you ma with mapping. And so they were trying out this new equipment right here uh, in our little area of Wycliffe and on the other side at Birds Point, Missouri. So we've got some Lewis and Clark history here as well, right here in Wycliffe and in this little part of the river. When we get into the early 20th century, the early 1900s, here's this property, this old Mississippian village. About in the 1880s, it was mapped by a geological surveyor named Robert Luffridge. And he mapped all these mounds here in Wycliffe. And so that's like one of the first recorded documentation of the mounds here in Wycliffe was in that Robert Lawfridge's Geological Survey of Kentucky, 1888. In around 1900, somewhere around in there, this property was bought up by the Wisconsin Chair Company, and they harvested it for their timber operations so that they could make furniture out of good old Kentucky hardwood. And they used the river to transport it. And on this site, we can still see remnants slight of the impact that that logging and that chair company had on the property. Um, we have a volunteer here today that does extensive research for us and she has found so many, Teresa here, she's found so much information about the Wisconsin chair company through her newspaper articles. So we know a little bit more about it than we knew when I first started here. When I first started here 23 years ago, I mean, it was barely a blimp in the in the in a paragraph yeah wisconsin chair company we didn't know anything about it but she's helped us learn a lot more and it was so extensive they even they had an office up here they had roads logging roads in and out um they had a sawmill up here um the manager of the wickliffe branch 
if you want to call it that, lived in a very nice three-story house right up here on what's called Wisconsin Street here in Wycliffe. This was a big deal here in the early 20th century. Sometime around 1930, 31, and 32, Highway 51 was being built. That was a very monumental task because that was going to connect Chicago to New Orleans, you know, on a north-south corridor here. We had the bridge that was built in the 1920s so that the highway construction was a major impact. And so in 1932, as the highway construction sort of hit this area right here, the south end of this bluff was blasted away. It's just gone. A lot of earth moving, flattened out on the other side of the highway there. And you know what they discovered? So many artifacts, pottery, stone tools, burials. It was unbelievable what the construction workers were finding from this old mound site up here. Well, step in Colonel Fane White King. He was a businessman from Paducah. He was what we would call a lumber magnate. Okay, he was in the lumber, the King Lumber Company of Paducah, a well established family over there. He knew everybody from Tennessee to Missouri to Illinois to Kentucky to Mississippi that was in the lumber industry. But his hobby was relic collecting. He was a major wheeler and dealer in Native American relics. He had a passion for it. And he had, he just, he knew everybody that had artifacts to, to buy and sell and trade, right? Well, he, this got his attention. And he made arrangements with the Wisconsin Chair Company to purchase this site. And you think, well, why? Well, you know, hmm. Well, in his travels and networking with artifact dealers and lumber business people, he had gone up to a site in Illinois called the Dixon Mounds. Dr. Dixon in the 1920s found a mound site of Mississippian culture there and it's north of Cahokia and developed it as a tourist attraction, opening up the burials there and was giving tours and making money off of the site there. And Fang King, I think a light bulb went off of in his head. He said, whoa, there's a site in Wycliffe, very similar to this. And so that's what he did. He purchased this site uh, for on the deed one dollar but we don't really know what he paid for it <laughs> or what deal was made uh, but he bought up the property here and he hired day, local day laborers along with he somehow he managed to get help from archaeologists from the University of Alabama uh, there at Tuscaloosa and so some of those archaeologists and those day laborers came up and they, in October of 1932, began digging into the first three mounds here. This is the biggest one, the next biggest one, and the burial mound, okay? King labeled his mound excavations as A, B, C, D, E, and even though University of Alabama did make a sort of a map of the site, there's not any field notes or records from those excavations. But we do have some old photos from the site that we can gain some information, but no field notes. We don't exactly know what, was, what he found or what was going on in these three mounds, but he built buildings wood frame, just like, it looks like that one, over the top of each one of these mounds so that immediately he began charging admission for tourists to come in and see the king mounds. He named them after himself, of course, right? And 
so that was that was the beginning of this attraction here. Um, later on, professional archaeologists started eyeing him and going, mm, what's that guy doing over there in Kentucky? And so he tried to get uh, or, or some professional archaeologists tried to get him to let them help him do this in a scientific methodical way, okay, instead of just digging into mounds. So by the time that he excavated that building over there, which was a long, low mound that he named Mound D, um, he got the help of a professional archaeologist from the University of Chicago, Faye Cooper Cole. Who's my archaeologist? You, you may have heard of him. Very, very famous. So Faye Cooper Cole and his students excavated that mound and they used a new method in archaeology called square and level. Woo! That means you're going to map it, right, on survey pins and have a coordinate system. And you're, they excavated back then by the, uh, the standard measurements, you know, so five foot by five foot excavation units. And... Um, in that building, you're going to see some a grid layout with string on the excavated floor. And on this end of the building, you're going to see the five foot by five foot levels, okay, or uh, units. And on the other end, you're going to see modern metric system, one by one meter units, right? And so the University of Chicago helped him excavate the other mounds, D, E, F, and labeling the artifacts. Woo! These students from Ch University of Chicago would label the artifacts where they were found. So if you look in some of the exhibit cases and you squint your eyes, you're going to see those little black labels in there on the artifacts that they came from this site uh, back in those excavations. Um, but he, but Fang King wanted this to really be a educational source at some point, he came to this conclusion, and the things that were found here, we believe he wanted to keep here, and his sideline business of buying and selling artifacts was that on the side, and so the things that were found here um, were kept special here, and promoting it as the ancient buried city, he decided to call it, give it a new name, ancient buried city, and um, tourists were coming in, wanting to see it. Um, sensationalism at that time was uh, Tutankhamun's tomb had been unearthed in Egypt in the 1920s. So Americans were fascinated with past cultures and lost cultures and lost civilizations. And so it, it was a pretty uh, well um, visited site. For, for an attraction back then. The main attraction was that burial mound. So when he excavated the burial mound, he uncovered about 150 burials that he left in place. So you're, you dug out the burials and left the skeletons in place so that people go inside that building and they look around inside and look at the Look at the skeletal remains. And that was uh, a main highlight of the ancient buried city for decades. There was, we don't know of any Native American influence or, or connection or, uh, you know, discussion, communication during that time period. Um, in 1946, after the after World War II, uh, Mr. King decided to retire, and he made arrangements to hand the site over to the Western Baptist Hospital Board of Paducah. He gave the hospital board the idea that this was a big deal. There's so much money to be made here. You can take this site and run it as a tourist attraction and the proceeds could help pay for your indigent uh, patients, patients who couldn't pay their hospital bill. And he really gave that hospital board. We have a newspaper photo from that time period where they're handing over the deed to the hospital, 
right? So the hospital did run this site as the ancient buried city for decades. They put managers in place. We had one manager here for 27 years, the Johnsons, local people here. They lived on the site. They managed the day-to-day -day stuff here. Um, and you can even see it as far as like, do you, do you remember like advertisements on barns? You know, see the largest ball of string, you know, and things like that. <laughs> ancient buried city they also had these roadside little signs that every few minutes or, or every you know like in increments along the highways it would say things like come see ancient buried city you know as each sign goes along you know or you know see the glowing rocks you know, and the burials and, you know, the things that they could promote. Uh, and we're standing on this building was the house of glowing rocks. Um, this was a building and um, that was the doorway and visitors on their guided tours would come in and they would tell everybody, okay, now stand around. And on the sides of all the walls were minerals and fluorescent rocks. And they'd tell everybody to smile really big. And they would flip the lights off, put the black lights on. And so those rocks would glow. They were fluorescent, right? But, you're, you know, and your teeth smile big because your teeth would show too, you know. So that was kind of a fun little sidebar. But it didn't have really anything to do with the Native American people who were here. Um, and so that was dismantled in 1983 when the hospital decided we need to get out of this. Fane King died in 1976, I believe, or 79. But Mrs. King died in 1982, like in the late 1982. And with the deal that they made with the hospital, they had to provide the Kings an annuity every year out of the proceeds uh, until they both died. So when finally Mrs. King died in 1982, they could not get rid of this place fast enough. It didn't make the money they thought it would. They were having to supplement it, you know, from the hospital. Uh, so public it was really a, 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 a group of concerned citizens got together and I'm just going to say I'm going to give him the credit most notably it was Fred Biggs from Mayfield and he got to get he got he started talking and moving and shaking and talking to legislators and who and this and that and we had a we had a, the attorney for the hospital at the time was a local Wycliffe uh, citizen uh, and um, uh, became later our, our state legislator, Charles Jevenden. And so they got together with Murray State University and said, you got to take this. This, is a, this would be a great educational resource. So Murray State University did take the side in 1983 and they totally reorganized the whole thing the glowing rocks had to go the that we used to have a cross up on top of the big mound where local people would come up for easter sunrise services and they'd hang christmas lights on it at christmas that also had to go but sidebar on that that cross then made local citizens activate and fundraise and now we have a 90 foot tall cross up there at fort jefferson hill and it is a beauty it's a panoramic view it is an attraction and it's it's just great up there but it didn't belong here and it was renamed the Wycliffe Mounds Research Center. They put a professional archeologist in charge, a very young Dr. Kit Lessler. And he began with the archeological field schools every summer. 
excavating the site in modern scientific methods through his field schools, we, we, as in Wycliffe Mounds, trained hundreds of students in archaeological methods. Those students today are out there in the archaeological world. They got their start here at Wycliffe Mounds. One of them we just talked about, the, the, we, the state archaeologist of Tennessee, I don't know if he's the current one, but he has been, doc, Dr. Well, that's right. In, 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 in memoriam, Dr. Dr. Bill Lawrence from Tennessee got his field school start here. So that's just one of dozens. This site's research with those field schools produced dozens and dozens of master's theses, PhD dissertations, uh, uh, so much research that we've contributed to the knowledge of Mississippian culture in the central Mississippi River Valley is phenomenal, and it's still going on. So Dr. Wessler, he uh, also encouraged the tourism part of this site, because if we've got visitors coming here, that helps preserve it. And we can talk about and educate and do educational programs and educational events and have school tours come in and we can teach them about pres preserving these historic sites that we have uh, in the Jackson Purchase and this site and keep it going for future generations. In about 2004, Murray State could no longer keep up with this site. They had it about 20 years. And so they were going to close the doors and walk away. Good old public outcry. What would we be without them? So again, public outcry became very vocal. But this time, the we had the Native American communities with us. And so there was a lot of fervent letter writing and phone calls to state legislators. And we were transferred, just transferred from a state university to the Commonwealth of Kentucky State Parks, right? And we've been operating as a state park since then, but it's, the, not, it's not the, the preservation and the education and the tourism experiences and opportunities are still there. Matter of fact, Kentucky State Parks brought in so many new amenities and, and, and really cleaned up the site and uh, refurbished the Welcome Center. Uh, and um, we've networked with so many tourism partners um, and so we're, we're still here. We're still trying to tell the story of the site and, um, and keep it going. And so groups like yours, we really appreciate not only coming here, but, you know, thinking about us from time to time. And uh, we have some upcoming events this summer. Um, and so please feel free to stop by in the Welcome Center to check those out. And the museum over there, wander over. There's pottery, stone tools, the excavated floor features, artwork, murals of a Mississippian village scene of what these people may have looked like. That's based on uh, 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 deep research of, of other Mississippian cultural sites and ethno historical uh, uh, reports from the 1500s and 1600s of these early explorers coming through the southeast and making journals and notes and information about these early uh, historic vi uh, villages like the Chickasaws, Choctaws, Cherokees, uh, Creeks, um, Osage, Quapaw, all in this area, right? So um, that's, um, that's sort of the overall history, not only the native people, but we've got quite a history of tourism here too, from the, from the decades, you know, through time. We've been open since 1932. And so that's a lot of tourist movement through the site. So we've got, we're, we love seeing the tour buses and having the programs. Um, 
I want to thank you really, especially. I, I, I really appreciate him. Bill, he reached out to, to think, you know, is it possible to even have me over there? Let's, yeah, let's do it. Let's do this thing. And so thank you for, the, for the, all of you that have uh, stayed on Zooming. And uh, let's open it up to, to, to questions because, you know, telling this story for 20 years, I leave stuff out. I forget half of what I know until somebody asks me a question. They're like, oh, yeah, then there's that thing. So, <laughs> so please come on, ask any old thing. And also, if you're not comfortable, you know, asking it now, I'm going to be around. I'm going to be hanging around over there. So just, just come on and ask. Um, like I said, each mound is connected by sidewalks. You can leisurely walk around. There's actually a great view atop this largest mound. It really helps put the village layout into perspective and how, how the river was so important. Um, so just, just go ahead and I thank you all very much. Bill, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, Qu any question? Teresa's got a question. I've got several questions. Yeah. Where did the dirt come to build the mountains? Ooh, can I say that one first? See, there's a good one. So lots of Mississippian mound sites like this have something called a borrow pit. We can see it when we look at the topography. These native people have, 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 have dug out pits where they borrow dirt to go and basket load and carry it up and build it for the mound, for the fancy people, the elites of the village, right? But this site doesn't seem to have a borrow pit. So one of the guesses and thoughts that we're looking at Perhaps they sloughed it off the side of this bluff because you're seeing the brushy overgrowth right now, right? But if you start go trepsing around on our, like our nature trail, you'll really see it. You see it on the nature trail. These are steep drop off bluffs, okay, to the bottom land of the Mississippi River. And even if you look at it topographically with, with things called LIDAR uh, technology, that's mapping. Uh, you're familiar with LIDAR, totally. Uh, he's a map guy over here. Um, so you can see we've got, we're kind of in an uh, interesting shape, this bluff is. And it, it might look bird-like. Lots of archeologists say that's coincidence couple of few think it might be something called a glyph that they purposely made it bird-like with wings, right? Um, Native American people, this Mississippian culture, birds were so important. Uh, they had things like called thunderbirds and the birds come up in their iconography. And as a matter of distinction, Mississippian pottery, they made images in their pottery called effigies. And when we count up the number of images in the pottery, the effigy pottery, there are more bird-like images than any other. Yes, we have fish images, we have bear images, we have human heads and images, but there's more birds. Question two. Question two, where are the bones living? Uh, you're, you're, she's one of our great volunteers, I tell you what. <laughs> Uh, that is such an important story and history part of this site. So those burials were on display for decades for people to look at. But in 1990, Congress passed a law called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Did you know that before 1990, there were no laws that protected Native American cemeteries. Our cemeteries are protected. You cannot grave rob, right? But you could with Native American cemeteries. And so finally, in 1990, we have a law that protects these Native American burial sites. And so immediately the director, Kit Wessler, he moved towards being in compliance. And it's complicated. 
because that's really difficult to go through something. What do you do? What is the right thing to do? And he grappled with that for a long time. And he sought out any Native American voice that would come and talk to him. Because to Native American people, this place was taboo. It was horrific. It was disgusting to them because their ancestors were on public view where people paid money to go in and gawk and make up stories about this, about what they're seeing. Like here, we had like the tale of the seven foot tall woman and the criminal buried upside down with a stone on his head. Not true. No one was seven feet tall here. You know, these were just stories made up about the site. And so what he did was he took the human remains off of public view. They stayed here on our site. He had a forensic anthropologist come in and document every human bone in that display and study them, which is how we know how many were men, how many were women. Ancient Buried City didn't know. It was the archaeological research that provided this information to us. And so consultation began. To keep the cemetery building open, Dr. Wessler put 10 replica burials up there. Uh, they were plastic. That was the, the, the years of the plastic bones. So many people come and remember that from the, nine, the 90s and the 2000s. And all of the display panels talked about the burial controversy and what did we discover about the burials and what are our, the plans were. And so that was the new exhibit for the cemetery building. Um, it took 20 years of consultations with archaeologists and lawyers and Native American tribes to finally settle that this is in the hands of the Chickasaw people today. They will take over the ancestors, uh, the ancestral claim here and oversee a reburial of all the human remains on the site at that time. And so in 2010, we began processing, documenting more human remains because in the excavations up to NAGPRA, anytime that Dr. Wessler found a burials, he boxed them up, documenting where they were come from, and then backfilled and moved on and stored them, right? As with he did the other artifacts, pottery sherds and stone tools. So in 2011, the Chickasaw came and we reburied all of those remains back in the cemetery building, down in their, in their original place where they came from, and then all the other burials were placed in there, and there were 414 sets of burials that we reburied in the cemetery building. And we uh, backfilled it in, we tore down the building, reestablished the mound of what it probably looked like in the 1200s. And so that was our reburial project, right? And so that uh, we had a a reburial ceremony in 2012 where the public could come in. The reburial with the Chickasaw was private. There is, there is a, another federal law that protects Native American religions and it protects Native people that want to come to their sacred sites and practice their religious thoughts, right? So that, that was private. So in 2012, we had a public ceremony where everybody was invited. Everybody came. So again, we had over 400 people here on the site to have a big public ceremony. The Lieutenant Governor of the Chickasaw Nation came to guest speak. Our cabinet secretary at that time came to guest speak. 
all of the county judges came from our four river counties. Um, and so we, a lot of uh, officials and legislators were here and school children. Ballard, our local school is Ballard County School and they bust in the entire sixth grade to come to that ceremony so that we could teach the next generation. That gets to me in my heart. That's what I love to hear because we want to make this a family friendly place where children can learn and we have lots of events that are that are kid focused and this is uh, sandy hart uh, here in wickliffe also we have a kentucky veteran and patriot museum with so much history of our military and um uh, uh, yes yes and it's right here in town Yes. But, so villagers just lived on the ground, packed around the central plaza, which is our upper parking lot, based on our excavations from through Murray State, when we find houses and we extrapolate how many people lived in these houses. We're thinking two to three hundred people. It was very small. Sorry, and these houses are uh, these these villages are every five to ten miles up and down the rivers they're on private land sometimes they're on other public land which is not but which may or may not be accessible it's just that the the other closest mound site to Wycliffe that's open to the public are two of them one is 45 miles that way in Missouri in East Prairie Missouri Tawasagi State Historic Site in Missouri the other one is 45 miles that way at across from Paducah, the Kincaid Mound site in Illinois near Metropolis. So those are the two local ones. But we were, we were, <laughs> well, neither one of those have staff. They're just mound sites that you can look at. Find them in the oddest places. The oddest places, but actually, but at, but. But actually, they're not that odd, Bill. If you study them, because they're gonna they they're in they're near resources. So, that's so you expect to find. yes. Oh, nowadays with our <laughs> yeah. development, right? If somehow yeah. it survived. It survived, and that's the other problem. Yeah. You know, so many of these mound sites don't survive. The whole south end of our village was blasted away in 1932. So think about the WalMarts and the highways that are built. However, today. There's state laws that protect that. You have to have a total archaeological review if you use public funds for anything. Well, there, there is a beautiful new visitor center there that visitors can go in. There's a couple of uh, things about it, but it's, I, it's the, Teresa can address this more. It's not staffed regularly. You have to call the city to ask. Well, now they're back on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I think I think to be clear on that though, it's not the site. No, to be clear, that's 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 just a visitor center, and the historic markers in and around that visitor center talk about the old fort and Lewis and Clark and the Chickasaws and uh, some other things. But the actual location of Fort Jefferson is down past it on the banks of Mayfield Creek and the Mississippi River. And it's privately owned. It is a registered archeological site, but you cannot have access to it. Does that help explain? These houses were typical wattle and daub house construction with thatch roofs. That, and there's a fantastic portrait of their houses in the museum where they, where they took uh, uh, wooden posts and they wove green cane, river cane, remember cane fishing poles, right? That's their wattle, their weaving. And then they daubed, packed muddy clay. And then they sometimes they whitewashed it. And then they put thatch roof. And their thatch was blue, big, big blue stem. That that grass that grows everywhere except here. <laughs> because I would love to have some thatch. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think yes.
two, two, a quick comment. Are you going to have for the Chickasaw dancers coming back? There, the they were there. They are in Ada, Oklahoma. The Chickasaw Nation is in Ada, Oklahoma. They uh, they had very strict COVID travel regulations, and so as soon as their governor allows the travel regulations again, they'll be back out doing their ambassador educational programs. The Chickasaw Nation dance troops goes all over the place representing the Chickasaws with their traditional dance, their traditional regalia, their traditional storytelling. And so we have them here from time to time when we can.